one. <laughs> And happy, happy New Year! It is, uh, it is good, it is good to gather with you in our Father's house. Uh, and we're, today we're celebrating the festival, the Epiphany, which is uh, rejoicing that Jesus is the light who shines in the darkness, uh, especially on a gray and cloudy day like today. It's good to have a reminder. Uh, I don't have any announcements aside from that. I don't have any other announcements, so we'll stand and begin with the invocation and then our first couple of songs. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord? 
just made this profound but simple confession that it's your breath, Lord, in our lungs, the very air that we breathe, the breath that we breathe, even the subwoofer that keeps making, it's this subwoofer back here that's uh, doing that. It's all a gift, a gift from God. And yet, how often, if we're honest, do we squander that gift? Do we take, take it for granted? But all this gift, all from God, And the ultimate squandering of that is, is to act as though God himself doesn't even exist. But when we behave this way, when we try to separate ourselves from God, we're falling short of the gift of the life that he intends, that he yearns to give to us. The scriptures call this sin. We sin against God, we sin against our neighbors, we sin against our friends, our families, and we're left with lives that are anything but joyful and filled with light, but are awful and in shadow and darkness. So let's take a few moments now to be honest before ourselves, be, to be honest before God about the sin and the darkness that is in our lives. In that silence, in that reflection, God still dwells. He gives a peace that passes understanding, a light that shines in the darkness. And that's the good news, the gospel good news, that the people that would otherwise dwell in darkness, you and me, a light has shown and continues to shine. It's the light that is Jesus. It's the new gift of his light being reminded again that not, not just today, but ultimately the darkness will be banished, and that you and I are set free from sin and death and the power of the devil. And so as we have cried out to God for mercy today, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I assure you and remind you that for the sake of Christ, all your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. As we observe this festival, the Epiphany, which emphasizes that Jesus is the light who shines in the darkness, our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult. Because of the abundance of the sea, shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Ephesians chapter 3. St. Paul writes, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you, Gentiles. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I've written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is the mystery. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power, to me, though I'm very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he, realized, that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand as we give honor to the words of the Holy Gospel lesson, the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. 
For so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Well, Happy New Year. So this weekend, we are observing the epiphany of our Lord. Epiphany, as a season of the church, is all about revealing or making things known. That is, God makes himself known. He reveals his wisdom to people. As such, epiphany includes the theme or the image of light. Light reveals things. It makes things known. This is why we continue to light the Christ candle during the season of epiphany. And during Epiphany, the church specifically focuses on the revelation, God's revelation made known through Christ, who is the light of the world. God is revealed to simple human beings in Christ. God is made, to, made known to us through the man, Jesus. So what does God make known to us in Jesus? What's revealed to us through Christ? Well, as the light of the world, Jesus reveals a lot to this sin-darkened world. But specifically, he makes known to us that God is for us. God reveals to us that in Christ, we simple beings are reconciled to God the Father. He makes known to us that through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have the forgiveness of sins and salvation. Jesus the light of the world, shines the gospel into our dark and dreary lives. God makes his love known to us. God reveals to us that he's for us and saves us from sin, Satan, and death. Through him who is the light of the world, God makes known his plan of salvation. And God's plan of salvation is an epic story. It's the story revealed to us in Scripture. For even though the Bible is made up of hundreds of individual stories, they all make up one grand story, one narrative, the story of God's plan to redeem and restore his fallen creation. As Christians, God has brought us into the, his story. He's made our individual stories a part of his grand story. But I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. Throughout the Old Testament, God continually unfolds his salvation plan. The key moments where God reveals his next step in that plan are where God makes covenants and promises. This year in confirmation class, Pastor Troy and I have been leading the kids through an overview of the Bible. And we decided to pay special attention to the covenants, the promises that God makes. For these covenants, these promises that God makes to people are threaded throughout the Bible. They're scripture's narrative arcs. And they all point to and are ultimately fulfilled by Jesus. Each covenant is like a new chapter in God's redemption story. So, there is the promise to Adam and Eve. That he would send a savior to defeat sin and Satan. Then there's God's promise to Noah, that he, would destroy, that he would not destroy his creation. And then there are God's covenants with Abraham, where God chooses a specific family to be his special people 
in the world. It's through this specific family that the people of Israel would come. And it's through the people of Israel that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would come. And it's through this Messiah that all peoples would be blessed. And next, there's the covenant that God establishes with the people of Israel on Mount Sinai, after God saved them from slavery, where he makes the Israelites his special people who are to live differently in this world. Fast forwarding a bit then, God makes a covenant with David, promising him that his offspring will always be on the throne of Israel. And then through the prophet Jeremiah, God promises a new covenant, a new testament with the people of Israel, where all will know him and he will forgive all of their sins. God gave these promises to his special people, the people of Israel. These covenants make up the story of God's special relationship with the Israelites. And the story reveals time and time again that God was faithful to all these covenants, even when the Israelites were not. And all of these promises find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. Jesus of Nazareth is the Jewish Messiah, the offspring of Abraham, a king in the line of David who completely obeys the entire Sinai covenant, who forgives sins and crushes the head of Satan and redeems all of creation. As the Jewish Messiah, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament covenants. Jesus is the new covenant for the people of Israel. In and through Jesus, God remained faithful to Israel, and in and through Jesus, God had indeed sent his Messiah to the Jews. This is God's story of salvation. This is God's epic narrative. This is the story of Israel. But even though God had determined to save his creation through one specific family, one people group, the people of Israel, his plan of salvation was never intended to be just for the Israelites. Yes, God had given the Old Testament promises specifically to the Jews. The covenants were their heritage. God had established a unique and particular relationship with Israel. Even Jesus declared that he was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But all along, God's promises, his plan of salvation, his sending of the Messiah, was for the sake of both Jews and Gentiles. And there are hints of this revelation throughout God's story of salvation. For example, at the Battle of Jericho, God delivered Rahab, and her family from destruction and brought them into the fold of Israel. Ruth, the Moabite, married Boaz and was the ancestor of King David. Elisha healed Naaman, the Syrian, of his leprosy. God sent Jonah to preach repentance to Nineveh. And the prophets proclaimed promise after promise that God would save the Gentiles. Indeed, the story of God reveals that he was not only for the Israelites, but for all people. And its covenants, while given to the Israelites, were intended to bless all the peoples of the earth. God's story, then, includes the Gentiles. For Jesus also ministered to Gentiles. The Magi, those wise men from the east, worshipped the young Jesus. The Simeon, after holding the infant Jesus in his arms, declared the child to be a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people, Israel. Jesus later healed the daughter of a Canaanite woman. Jesus spoke with a Samaritan woman by a well. He healed the servant of a Roman centurion, and he cleansed a Samaritan of his leprosy. Indeed, Jesus brought Gentiles into God's salvation story. And he charged his apostles with the task of preaching the good news concerning himself to all people to make disciples of all nations. And throughout the book of Acts, we see God's story continuing on as the early church preached Christ to the world, to both Jews and Gentiles, bringing more and more people into the story of God. Through Christ, God was being made known to the world. And this brings us to today's epistle reading from Ephesians. And really, the whole book of Ephesians is a great epiphany book. For through this letter, St. Paul reveals how Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is also the Messiah for the Gentiles, for the whole world. 
For as an apostle, Paul was specifically tasked with sharing the, good, the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles. And this is what he's talking about in Ephesians 3. In, he, in verses 4 through 6, he declares to the Ephesians that when you read this, you can perceive my insights into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery that Paul's talking about is God's redeeming work. In previous generations, this work was hidden from people. But now this saving work, this mystery, has been made known through Christ. Through Jesus, God has made known his grand plan of salvation, his story of redemption. The mystery is no longer hidden. It's revealed in Jesus. And furthermore, the gospel, this salvation story, is not just for the Jews. It's also for the Gentiles. Through faith in Christ, both Jews and Gentiles are fellow heirs of Jesus. Both Jews and Gentiles are members of Christ's body. Both Jews and Gentiles are partakers of the promises of Christ. In other words, in and through Jesus, God not only fulfills the promises, he, the promises he gave to the people of Israel, he also makes the Gentiles participants in those promises given to Israel. In other words, God has brought the Gentiles into his salvation story. The story of Israel, with all of its promises and covenants, is now also the story of those Gentiles who have faith in Christ. All who believe are brought into this epic story of redemption. For in and through Christ, God has not only redeemed Israel, he has created the new Israel. The new Israel does not consist of one ethnic group bound together by blood, but it consists of peoples from all over the world bound together by the blood of Jesus. The new Israel is the church. And it's through the church that the Holy Spirit unites people to Christ and brings them into God's story of salvation. All who believe in Christ have been grafted into the new Israel. Therefore, the story of Scripture isn't just Israel's story. It's the story of all who believe. God's redemption story, given to us on each page of the Bible, is now our story. It's now your story. God's promises of forgiveness, life, and salvation are given to you. The gospel is for you. God's love and hope are for you. God is for you. And as such, this means that God redeems your story, the story of your life with all of its twists and turns as he brings it into his story. And even when our stories make an unexpected turn, when a loved one dies, we know that for the redeemed, it is not the end of the story. God redeems our stories. And God's redemption didn't end with the last verse of the Bible. It's an ongoing narrative that continues to this day. Really, it's an open-ended story as God's word is preached throughout the world, as more and more people are brought into to the faith through word and the waters of baptism. More and more people are being brought into the church, the new Israel. More and more people are brought into God's salvation story. Christ is being made known to more and more people. And this is what Paul means in verse 10. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. It's through the church that God is revealed to the world. It's through the church that God is made known to us. And God's not revealed through some abstract concept of the universal church. God is made known through local congregations. This means that God in his story of salvation is made known specifically through our congregation. Think about that. Through the ministry here at St. John, God has made himself known to us. For nearly 170 years, the mystery of Christ has been revealed here at St. John Lutheran Church. Jesus 
has made himself known through the preaching of his word, through his cleansing waters of baptism, and through the consumption of his body and blood in communion. God makes himself known to you in this place, in this congregation, in his church here at St. John. In this congregation, God has united us as his people and has given us his story of salvation. And not only has the mystery of God's salvation been made known to us, to God's people here, but through the simple but profound ministry of word and sacrament, through the work that you and I do here at St. John, God makes himself known to the world around us. Thanks be to God who through our, our church, Christ, the light of the world, is made known to us. Thanks be to God that through the church, God's story of salvation has been and continues to be revealed to us. And thanks be to God that through the church, the Holy Spirit has brought us into God's redemption story, making it our story. And thanks be to God that in this story, God is revealed to be God for us. Amen. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue worship at this time with the prayers of the church. I invite you to please stand. Before the prayers of the church, and as Pastor Luke alluded to, uh, we pray for and mourn with the Winterstein family, uh, Alicia and Thomas and Jill, as uh, Chuck, our brother in Christ, fell asleep in Jesus on Friday. And uh, so while we mourn, uh, we're thankful for the hope that he knows as he sees Christ face to face. Uh, one of the things, and it's a Christmas Day reading here on the front of the altar that uh, as Pastor Luke was preaching and and thinking about this in terms of Jesus being the light, it says here, in him was the life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And so we rejoice that, uh, that Chuck and those saints who have gone before know that light, but we rejoice in that uh, as we receive it and are reminded of it in word and sacrament. So we continue now with the prayers of the church. O Lord of glory, you have bought us with your lifeblood as the price. You have promised that, uh, that we who would otherwise dwell in darkness, in sin, in the shadow of death, that, that we don't dwell alone and that darkness is not the end, does not have the victory, that, that Jesus is the light and in him is salvation and victory. And so even as darkness covers our world, you make your church to shine with the brightness of Jesus, the one who is the resurrection and the life. Give each of us the assurance, the peace that passes understanding, the, the reality that as we breathe in and breathe out this life in and through your Holy Spirit, that we have life and light in rich measure. And we pray boldly that all the world would be drawn closer to you, to know that he, Emmanuel, has come to us, that he is in our midst, and that we, by faith, would see and behold our salvation. Lord, you bless us with this gift of the church, where people are born again, where ears and hearts and eyes and minds are open, where mouths join together and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We pray that we would be faithful servants as we serve here at St. John through our church and school and Little Wings Ministries, that we would have the boldness of St. Paul to speak what you have revealed to us and to the world, and that we would receive with hands open wide all of your good gifts. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our homes and all those who dwell in them. We thank you. Uh, for the year that was as you were at work in our world in 2021 and here at the beginning of this calendar year, the year of our Lord 2022, that it is your world and help us to be faithful and follow you. We pray that you would guide all those who are placed in positions of leadership in our nation, that you would scatter the darkness of this world and through the faithful witness of your church, show and reveal the light of Christ. Lord, we know that you are a God of compassion, that you are the good shepherd who laid down your life, who took it up again, 
who walks and carries people through the valley of the shadow of death. And so we entrust to your care all those who are in any kind of danger or trouble, sadness, adversity, or need. Hear our prayers for the sick and the suffering, for all those impacted by COVID-19, for those who are being treated for cancer, and for those who care for them, for those who are homebound. We pray especially that you would give comfort to all those who mourn, and we lift up to your before your throne of grace, the Winterstein family, specifically Alicia and Thomas and Jill. Sustain them and each of us with the confident hope in the resurrection. We rejoice that you gather those saints who have gone before close to you and for the gifts that you give here as we come before you in this sacrament of the altar that we not only join with angels and archangels, but with all the company of heaven in this foretaste of the Feast of Victory. And on this epiphany, as we observe the epiphany, we thank you that you brought the Magi of old to come and worship Jesus as Savior and Lord, and that you also have invited us to worship you. So help us to be faithful in all things. And we thank you that we can join together and pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated at this time. Our service continues as we gather our tithes and offerings Please also fill out the card in the seat back, letting us know you're here in worship today.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament, in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Praise to the King of Kings. 
the Lamb, the one who died to set us free. It's by His blood we've been redeemed. It's by His light that we now see. You set the table, you bring us in. Here in your presence we find life again. The feast of your victory, God. There's restoration in this breathless cup. This is the feast of your victory, God. 
This eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in both body and soul into life everlasting. Depart in the peace and joy of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pastor Luke reminded me, I skipped the creed. So let's stand and confess the, the creed. So completely out of order. And then we'll end with the song. So we'll confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is not a God who is far away, but a God who has come to us, and he invites us to come to his table, and to not just to have a couple morsels full, but a feast of victory in and through Jesus, the crucified and risen, the reigning and returning Savior. So in that light and truth, um, the Holy Spirit at work in this place, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
seen that. Child of God, yes I am. 